Hello, fellow readers. Uh, this is James Stevens from Exploring God's Library 2020. And it's week 30. The date is Tuesday, May 5th, 2020. If you're new, you're more than welcome to join us on the journey as we read through God's library, line upon line, precept upon precept, as revealed in his library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is how the Bible reading program works. It's really quite simple in that you read straight through the select passages, and if you do that, you'll be through the entire Bible uh, in a year uh, in just 20 minutes a day. First, we start with the scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, composed of 39 books, widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, uh, the Law, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the Five Scrolls. So each day, we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a Parsha, a section of a biblical book, which is based on a, a religious reading custom uh, way back into the 6th century B.C. under the Babylonians when the Jews were in exile. And this discipline ensured that everyone would be on the same page uh, as they were reading the Bible on a daily basis. So uh, on the count of its brevity, the Torah portion this week is uh, uh, in two sections. And it's after the death and also the holy ones. We then read a portion from the wisdom literature, and in particular, this week we'll be reading from the book of Job. At other times, we'll be reading from the historical books of the, New Te of the Old Testament, which include Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's one long narrative uh, covers about a thousand years of biblical history. Or from the minor prophets like Hosea, Joel, or Amos, who preach against corruption and idolatry and, and the like. And uh, we're looking at when people were looking at relying on prosperity rather than on God and worship idols. Then each week we'll read a psalm of the day, which is a religious reading custom that the Jewish communities had for, for centuries. And then one of the 150 psalms, so we'll go through the psalms twice, twice a year. And finally, a proverb, and a, it'll be a proverb every day. And, um, and then, or I should say, finally, a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Then every Tuesday, we'll briefly review our readings, uh, providing commentary drawn from various source resources. So if you have any questions that arise in the course of your readings, you can, um, uh, you can go to exploringgodslibrary.org, and you can make a comment there. And also, if you subscribe there, you can uh, receive our daily updates because we're, we post the scriptures every day. And then any YouTube videos or, or text, etc., that would be uh, supportive, supportive for the reading of that text uh, would be very helpful. Well, first of all, we're going to begin in prayer. And we're going, the, one of the Psalms that we uh, read this week is. Uh, found in Psalm one, uh, Psalm nineteen. So, this is a, a psalm of David to the chief musician, and it's talking about the perfect revelation of the Lord. So, uh, it's um, it's a you know, it's a profound uh, hymn or psalm, which is sung to God. But we'll pray. Our heavenly Father, we come before your throne right now. And in your word, it says that your heavens declare your glory, the glory of God, and your firmament shows forth your handiwork. Day into day, it utters speech, and night into night, it reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And our Heavenly Father, as we do come into your presence tonight to review the readings that we've had this week and to search your word and to seek your face, we pray that you would be present at this hour and that you would speak to our hearts through your word, through the testimony of your saints who are comment on your word and do and do diligently dig deep to find those hidden treasures, exposing them to us and giving us, uh, edifying us and, and giving us wisdom and knowledge that we might live and apply them in our daily life. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your creation, your heavens, your, your moon, the sun, the stars that guide us by night and, and the sun to heat us and to, to, um, uh, to help the things grow as we face the spring now and see many things growing. Thank you, Lord, for your abundant blessings. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would be over us and guide us and protect us, each one of us, our families, in all of our various needs and open our ears and our eyes and our heart and our mind to what the Roha Kadesh, the Holy Spirit, is saying to us in the covenant community this, um, this hour. And we pray these things in the name of our blessed Savior and Redeemer, our King, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we turn uh, our attention to the Old Testament book of Leviticus and Job, we want to answer the question, why do we need the Old Testament? Uh, many people say, it, well, isn't it out of date? But the simple answer is no. I mean, doctrine pervades the entire Bible, uh, starting with history of creation and Genesis. And understand the law, one has to study the Torah or the, the Pentateuch and, and the, uh, the Old Testament for that, that matter. Because how can you really understand what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians when he encourages the, the, the church to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Those psalms are found in the Old Testament. Richard, Richard Steele in his Discourses Upon Uprightness provide an astute answer to that question why we, should, why we need the Old Testament. He said, He that would be wise, let him read the Proverbs. He that would be holy, let him read the Psalms. To understand the workings of God, His wisdom, his character, his heart, we have to study the Old Testament in its entirety. Walter Kaiser, the famous Old Testament scholar, reminds us that the most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament is to be used and what roles it must play in life is found in First Timothy, or in Second Timothy 3.16, where it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now recall that when the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Bereans and others, he only had the testimony of Jesus and in the Old Testament, and nothing had been canonized uh, in what we now call the New Testament. Now I was looking uh, at some things, you know, one uh, question was asked, how many times has, um, you know, has, have, have um, New Testament, you know, like Jesus, referred to the Old Testament or the apostles referred to the Old Testament. I found something interesting today from on a Puritan board, and uh, it, uh, it went something like this. Jesus has been proven to be not only a credible witness, but a messenger from God. In all his teachings, he referred to the divine authority of the Old Testament. Matthew 5, 17 through 18, 8, 17, 12, 40 through 42, Luke 4, 18 through 21, 10 through 25, um, through 28, 
of chapter 15, 29 through 31. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. And he said he quoted the Old Testament 78 times. And the Pentateuch, he, uh, which is the first five books of the Bible, he quoted a, quoted a total of 26 times. He also quoted from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Malachi. He referred to the Old Testament as the scriptures. Sometimes people will uh, call them the scriptures. The word of God, the wisdom of God. The apostles quoted uh, 209 times from the Old Testament and considered it the oracles of God. The apostles quoted it 209 times from the Old Testament, and, or I read that, of the Old Testament in hundreds of places predicted the events of the New Testament, and the New Testament is a fulfillment and testifies to the genuineness and authenticity of the Old Testament. Both Testaments must be considered then as the Word of God. So I think that's really, really important. Well, presently we're reading from the book of Leviticus. And, uh, and I, um, the excellent help really comes from uh, studying the New Testament commentary by Gordon J. Winham. And he has really been very helpful in just illuminating the text, giving us a, a greater understanding of the culture and history of the text, because Leviticus can be difficult. He said that Leviticus used to be the first book that Jewish children read when they were studying in the synagogue. And then in, but the modern church, he said, doesn't take it very seriously. And it's not something that they really read much. So they just kind of casually refer to the book of Leviticus. But Winham takes it with equal seriousness. He realizes that uh, we've got to look at the original meaning of the text and then look at the abiding theological value. So he, he looks at the Old Testament rituals and sacrifices and he compares them with... Uh, compares and contrasts them with biblical customs and with the practices of various ancient Near Eastern cultures. So he'll, he'll um, uh, really contrast the two. And one of the things he, he uh, prescribes in the last week was how the priestly ministry is conducted. And, he, and God requires that those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. Um, Gordon Winham reminds us that the same is true of us who are believers in Christ Jesus. The church is now a cho chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own, uh, own people. That's in 1 Peter 2.9. And last week we addressed the issues of food offered to idols and how the early church resolved their customary differences and arrived at the final conclusion um, that there, was no, there is a greater law. And the reason for abstaining is now different, is the law of love. And he said, the Christian, according to Paul, may eat anything as long as it gives no offense in so doing. But should this freedom lead to a fellow Christian stumbling, he should avoid those foods which lead to suspicion. If your brother is being injured by what you eat, according to Romans 14, 15, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one who, for whom Christ died. I mean, you may be able to, you know, to have a, a glass of wine, but maybe uh, the people that you're ministering to have a, uh, a propensity to become alcoholics because of the wine or because of beer or things of that sort. So in certain cultures, people are drinking, but you may have the liberty to do so. Uh, but uh, when you're in that context of ministry, it's really important not to offend your brother and indefinitely... Um, to uh, walk in love. So this week we're going to briefly look at uh, Wenham's commentary, and we're going to race through that because we have a lot to cover. And um, we're going to look at a couple things, which are, okay, page 40, 246. Uh, he's talking about Leviticus 17. He says, throughout history, God's people have ten tended to forget that they were, that they owe exclusive allegiance to God. So we have a tendency towards idolatry. Um, 
it said within a few years of the uh, propagation of the law, we read of their joining themselves to the Baal of Peor. That's a, and they're worshiping idols. They sacrificed the demons, which were no gods. And so there's, a, there's kind of that propensity where people just kind of slip back into their idolatry, kind of like dogs returning to their own vomit. And so we have to not imitate the detestable practices of the nations. Paul warned the Corinthians against participating in heathen worship because there is involved the worship of demons. Uh, what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? In new guises, both materialism, mammon, and demonology, demonology will seek to woo the Christian from total commitment to Christ. I remember going to a, um, there was a, um, a Thai festival, but it happened to be at a temple. And, um, and so sometimes you really like those uh, satay sticks and things like that. But then we also found out that, you know, people are offering some of their foods to the idols. And so for a new Thai Christian, it would cause them to stumble. Um, or going to, um, uh, going to a Chinese restaurant and you walk in and the Chinese restaurant, uh, uh, as I had done, it was a perfectly nice Chinese restaurant serving normal Chinese food. And then it got bought by new owners and the new owners uh, served blood. Um, so there's blood in everything. So, you know, it's a, there is a prohibition, according to Leviticus, of drinking animal blood. And um, and it seems uh, uh, Paul was uh, really saying it should be avoided because it might offend Jewish Christians. And even in in the Jerusalem Council, they said they they said um, uh, was I think it was they'd finally come to a conclusion in the Jerusalem Council where the apostles, elders, and brethren wrote a letter to the brethren who, of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and uh, Cilicia. And they said, Greetings. Since we have heard that some, of, some who went out from us have been troubled with you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. In other words, there were Greeks that um, were, were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And yet there were Jews who were Pharisees who had come to faith, and they were saying, "Well, you've got to be circumcised. You know, to you got to keep the whole law." And uh, and yet, in, in Jerusalem Council, they came to a different con conclusion. And so this letter was to those brethren and said, "It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord, and that's all the apostles, to send." chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who had ministry to the Gentiles, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Ju Judas, and not Judas uh, Iscariot, but the other Judas, and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. First, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So that was kind of a, just a little bit of that. Um, I'm just going to uh, do a couple more things in here. What time are we at, Elizabeth? We are at 626. 626, okay. So... Um, it says, in the teaching of Christ, the identification of life with blood is reaffirmed. It may be that the Pauline view of the blood prohibition has its roots in our Lord's teaching, for in it, the Levitical identification of blood with life is at once reaffirmed and transfigured. According to Leviticus, the blood is in the life, or is the life, and therefore must not be drunk. Those who ignore this rule will be cut off. Cut off is a euphemism for killed. Um, according to our Lord, it is his blood that gives eternal life, and those who wish to enjoy it uh, must drink his blood. But this is different. 
you know, in some in the early church, sometimes the uh, the Romans would call them um, they would call them well, it was no, it was it was um, um, they're eating eating people's uh, flesh, um, not carnivores. <laughs> um, in Papua New Guinea. People eat people. Oh, um, <laughs> Just slipped my mind. Okay. Headhunters, uh, head uh, people that uh, uh, are um, eating people's flesh. Well, you don't eat people's flesh, so they're not being accused of uh, eating people's flesh. It'll come to me. It just slipped my mind. Um, so each time that Lord's Supper is administered, the worshippers remind through Christ's word, "This is my blood." That is only through his Savior's death upon the cross that he enjoys eternal life. But the, the wine does not become blood. It's, it's a symbolic thing. Um, we're not, um, we're not uh, drinking human blood, which is defined by Scripture as abhorrent, as abomination. We're not... Um, uh, we're not... Uh, we're not yeah, eating human flesh. Uh, we're eating a piece of bread which represents the Lord's, uh, the Lord's life. He says, I'm the bread of life. So it's very symbolic. Uh, but it's a spiritual transaction. So that's really important. Um, and then uh, they go into, in chapter 18, they go into some uh, different things. It's talking about uh, there's an exhortation to avoid heathen customs. I'm the Lord your God. And he says uh, that um, he expected the people of Israel to imitate God, to be holy. For I'm holy. I'm the Lord your God, and you must sanctify yourselves and be holy because I'm holy, as we er read earlier in Leviticus 11.44. Uh, third, this phrase often provides a motive for observing a particular law. Under the covenant, the people of God were expected to keep the law, not merely as a formal duty, but as a loving response to God's grace and redemption. And also says, you must not behave as they do in the land of Egypt, in the land of Canaan. The prevalence of the customs denounced here as Egyptian and Canaanite perversions is well attested in Scripture and in non-biblical sources, he says. In the Egyptian royal family, brothers married sisters. The laws of uh, Hammurabi and the Hittites banned some of the incestuous relationships listed here, but by implication allowed other unions mentioned here. Even the patriarchs just disregarded some of these rules. Abraham married his half-sister in Genesis. Jacob was married to two sisters simultaneously. Uh, these were not his sisters, but relatives. Homosexuality is uh, referred to in verse 22. It's referred to among the Canaanites and also tested by in, in Mesopotamia. Bestiality is also known from Egyptian, Canaanite, and Hittite sources. There was a cult in the eastern delta that involved the cohabitation of women and goats. Indeed, Ramses II, possibly the pharaoh of the Exodus, claimed to be the offspring of the god Ptah, who took the form of a goat. Ugaritic texts speak of gods copulating with animals, having sex with animals. So, Bestiology was totally forbidden in Leviticus and in biblical law. Homosexuality, bestiology, all those things are forbidden. In connection with the offerings to Moloch, the charred bones of children were found in a temple near Amon, Amon, where they did a archaeological dig. And so you can see that there were a lot of they were practicing child sacrifice. And so we must not follow their rules. So if you follow them, it means that to walk after them. So the idea in life, in, in our journey, life is uh, much like uh, in Scripture, uh, it's, or in Christian literature like Pilgrim's Progress. It's, it's a journey that we're on. And the rule is one of the number of words for law and the Pentateuch. So then there was also um, uh, more about uh, forbidden unions, uh, no man among you may approach any of his close relatives to have sexual intercourse, so there's no you know, marriage within the family. 
Um, and, um, you know, so you, you go through these things. You're not to have intercourse with your brother's wife. So there's a lot of things that protected the family unit from this intermarriage and these, these problems. Um, we're not to profane the name of your God, you know, which they profaned. And um, I, something that just caught my eye, the remnants of mulk sacrifices have been found in North Africa, and there's evidence to suggest it derived from Phoenicia. It has often been supposed that these sacrifices involve throwing the children alive into the flames. DeVoe points out that only one contemporary description of Carthaginian practice may imply this. The other state that the babies were killed first. He suggests that this custom was practiced in Israel only from about the 7th century BC at about the time this part of Leviticus was being composed on normal critical theory. Since he wrote, evidence of child sacrifice has been discovered in Jordan from the period of the conquest. So some terrible things. So, not to profane the name of your God, homosexuality is condemned throughout the scripture, Genesis 19, Leviticus 20, 13, Judges 19, 22, Romans 1, 27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Abomination is a term that uh, expresses very strong disapproval uh, in Hebrew. And it's used five times in the chapter. Um, it comes from a root meaning to hate or to abhor a practice. Cannibals. Ah, the term was cannibals. I knew that term would come to us as cannibals, right? Uh, cannibals. Uh, I remember uh, we visited uh, some Wycliffe uh, translators that had come into Pasadena uh, with some of the members of the church that had been converted from Papua New Guinea. And these, these uh, uh, young men, which were older, and some older men, were actually talking about how they used to be cannibals. They used to eat human beings um, of other tribes, believing that they gained power. So, um, but they don't eat people anymore. Or, I mean, I'm sure that happens in certain tribes, but in some of the Christian tribes, they've really been transformed. It's quite, quite uh, amazing. We just watched a... Uh, a Remarkable video, which I highly recommend. It was uh, Etow, E A T O U W. I think it is. I think you can see it online. Uh, we'll, we'll put a put it. Remind me. We'll put a link up. We'll put a link up on Exploring God's Library. It's it's a wonderful. They they actually tell the Bible chronologically, and um, it's remarkable to see how the people were so intently listening about this um, this perfect hero, Jesus, and his sacrifice on behalf of their sin and just the overwhelming joy that uh, came to them when they realized that their sins and transgressions were forgiven. Anyway, this is just kind of a, a few of the things. I'm going to now move to the next uh, section. Um, we're going to look at the book of Job. Now, at EGL, Exploring God's Library, we one of the things we aim to do is bring links to you of material that actually can help give you a great understanding if you so desire you know, to read more about these different texts. And uh, one of the excellent uh, links I ran across was from Dr. Gregory W. Parsons, uh, who has pastored several churches in Texas and serves as a professor of biblical studies at the Baptist Mission Missionary Association Theological Seminary. He is a noted scholar in the book of Job, and his condensed commentary can be found on, this, uh, on the study notes of the Nelson Study Bible in the New King James Version. He's also contributed numerous articles to scholarly journals such as Bibliotheca Sacra, and that's uh, a, uh, an excellent journal, they say, that uh, talks about a lot of biblical issues. But I just wanted to read something that gives you a picture since we're reading Job. And I'd never heard it put quite this way, but it's fascinating to me. Because I was trying to determine, well, what kind of, where does the book of Job, it's not a historical book, obviously. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, um, a prophet, a book of you know, prophecy. 
it's more of a, uh, a wisdom book. Uh, but it's of a different kind of literary genre. And so he, Dr. Parsons, actually wrestled with this. And he says, The consens- consensus that Job is a literary work of the highest magnitude does not make the task of clarifying it with regard to its literary type any easier. Many, many literary critics have attempted to place the book of Job into one overarching literary genre or category. It's a category of you know, literature, like Proverbs is wisdom literature, Psalms, you know, the songs. Um, however, this writer, uh, and po- you know, poetic, however, this writer views all attempts to fit the book into one category as failing to do justice to the complex nature of its literary fabric. And these are the suggestions that about what kind of genre that the book of Job falls into. It's like three of them. And one is, a literary genre. The second is a, the lawsuit, which is a legal or judicial genre. And the fi- final one is a lament, kind of like Lamentations. You know, um, um, Jeremiah you know, was a book of Lamentations. Or uh, often you'll see Lamentations in the book of Psalms. And the, uh, oh, the other one is controversy dialogue or dispute, which is similar to the wisdom genre of contest literature. Never heard of that before in the ancient Near East. So the basic views. Number one, this is fascinating to me because it's really true in a lot of respects. It, it sets it up very well. I think if, if you're an attorney or have uh, had any lawsuits, you'll find this very interesting. Because of the occurrence of legal terminology in Job, many scholars have argued that the judicial sphere is the backdrop of this book. Reichter understands the book of Job as a secular lawsuit by Job against God, whereby the friends serve as witnesses who apparently place a countersuit against Job. Chapters 4 through 14 are viewed as a preliminary attempt at reconciliation out of court and chapters 15 through 31 are seen as formal court proceedings between Job and his friends. The resumption of the case against Job by Elihu and the judgment of God is are chapters 38, 1 through 42, 6. In the form of a secular counter lawsuit between God and Job result in the withdrawal of the accusation by Job. Sholnick, another theologian, has presented a scholarly argument for viewing Job as a lawsuit drama, whereby the man, Job, takes his opponent, God, to court. The issue of the legal guilt or innocence of the two parties involved is resolved through a lawsuit in which the friends are judges and witnesses. Lament. Although Westerman recognized the existence of a controversy dialogue, he argued that the most important element in the book is the lament, the personal lament, is well known in the Psalms, and the lament, lament by Job. You know, where he just said, "You know, better. You know, my the curse would be the day I was born. You know, I, I shouldn't have been born. I mean, when you know, I you know, I should have just died before I was born. I mean, it was like it, in chapter three. I mean, it's really heartbreaking because I mean, the man is just in so severe pain. I mean, I, I, not many people understand this kind, this depth of pain. But Job, Job. And the ends, the dialogue proper, completely encloses the controversy speeches. This other theologian guess suggests that the original folk book of Job, now allegedly extant only in the prose sections, the prologue, was the paradigm of the answered lament, patterned after three Mesopotamian texts in which an answer of God, Mesopotamia, this is kind of like uh, by Babylon, right? Mesopotamia? Yeah, that area? Remember that? Pro, he's talking about Mesopotamia. Between two rivers. Between two rivers. Okay. Um, between what were the two rivers? Tigris and Euphrates. Tigris and Euphrates, right. Um, in which an answer of God came to the sufferer. However, guests argued that the author of Job changed the original intent of the paradigm of the answer lament, whose form he ironically employs by substituting in the poetic sessions a demand for a trial with God. Uh, instead of the allegedly original plea for mercy. So anyway, then there's controversy dialogue, and to finish that up with, some scholars have proposed that Job is a variant of the philosophical dialogue. I mean, 
I, I tell you, when I was reading, we were reading this this week, I mean, when you start listening to Job talk, I mean, he is, what a deep thinker, such a deep thinker. And, um, and so, uh, so skilled and adept at meeting, you know, this kind of worthless counsel of his, his friends. And we were saying this morning with friends like that, who needs enemies? Um, you know, the poor man. But you kind of get the, the idea. So Job is a variant of the philosophical dialogue, namely a controversy dialogue, similar to the disputation or contest literature in the ancient Near East. Although Crenshaw acknowledges that Job cannot be squeezed into one narrow genre, he considers the controversy dialogue, which is influenced by its function within prophetic literature as self-vindication as a major literary type in the book. Okay, now uh, I will put a, a link up to the entire uh, discussion. It's quite interesting. But I also want to um, point you to something that if you're looking at a, a really good introduction to a biblical book online, uh, Grace to You, which serves as a teaching minister for Dr. John MacArthur, who has pastor Grace Community Church for over 50 years. He serves as the president or did serve as the president as of the um, Master's University and also the Master's Seminary, and now he's the chancellor. Um, it's, uh, this ministry really provides an excellent introductory overview to every book of the Bible. And then also the teaching materials have been collected, so it's very systematic. And you can go to uh, uh, gty.org in the library, and we'll put a link up to this. And it's very good. I'm just going to race through this, just a quick review, because we're running out of time. Uh, he has. A, he starts with the title of the book, and so he'll go through the title, and then um, then he'll he'll look at the author and the date, and and look at the background and the setting, some of the historic and theological themes, and then he'll go into uh, some of the themes that that are treated in the book. You know, for for example, a major reality of the book is the inscrutable mystery of innocent suffering. God ordains that his children walk in sorrow and pain, sometimes because of sin, sometimes for chastening, sometimes for chase, strengthening, and sometimes they give opportunity to reveal his comfort and grace. But there are times when the compelling issue in the suffering of the saints is unknowable because it is for a heavenly purpose that those on earth can't discern. Well, I think that's a pretty powerful, just little chunk of study right there. The inscrutable mystery of innocent suffering. I'm going to underline that. It's very important. You know, it's like, why, why do people suffer? And then he goes into, uh, he'll list some of the elements of some of the things that, that um, you know, some of the truths of Job's experience, and he'll list some truths. Suffering may be intense, but it will ultimately end for the righteous and God will bless abundantly. And then he'll go into some of the interpretive challenges. And, and I think this is really important. For example, he'll, he'll say here, understanding this book requires particularly the difference between man's wisdom and God's, to admitting that Job and his friends lack the divine wisdom to interpret Job's circumstances accurately. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Um, those friends kept trying while Job learned to be content in God's sovereignty and mercy. The turning point or resolution for this matter is found in Job 28, where the character of divine wisdom is explained. Divine wisdom is, a rare, and is rare and priceless. Man cannot hope to purchase it, and God possesses it all. We may not know what is going on in heaven or what God's purposes are, but we must trust in him. Because of this, the matter of believers' suffering takes a back seat to the matter of divine wisdom. And so then um, he, uh, he concludes each of the introductions with like an outline. So he'll go through the whole outline. So before you read um, a, a book, it's sometimes good to just get, a, get an introductory uh, perspective on the book so you understand the context that you're walking in. 
you know, whether it's an historic book or a poetic book or, or it's a prophetic book um, or it's a letter um, or it's you know, uh, wisdom literature, etc. or it's a poetic piece. Um, so, uh, and also you have an outline. So you get the outline at the very end of this introduction so it'll go through the whole thing and it breaks it down pretty, pretty carefully and, and well. well. I'm going to let that um, stop with that one. We'll move now to, to um, Proverbs. Um, one of the Proverbs that struck, struck me this week is in Proverbs 18.22. And he says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And, uh, and I think that uh, recently I was hearing a pastor uh, preach about you know, to young men that, you know, they should, you know, be, um, you know, looking for their, their wife, you know, get on with life because, you know, young men are starting to get married and, you know, at 35 years old rather than getting, you know, married, you know, at, uh, uh, at a younger age. And, um, and so I, I found that uh, in, in Charles Bridges' commentary on Proverbs, he does an excellent job of looking over these things, but one of the contemplations by Bishop Beveridge, his resolution is well worth recording. And this is in Charles Haddon Spurgeon's uh, Treasury of David, which is an excellent uh, reference book on when you're reading the Psalms. It's uh, very rich. I, I highly recommend it. And Bifer, uh, Bishop Beveridge says, I shall always endeavor to make choice of such a woman for my spouse who hath first made choice of Christ as a spouse for herself, that none may be made one flesh with me who is not made one spirit with Christ my Savior. For I look upon the image of Christ as the best mark of beauty I can behold in her, and the grace of God as the best portion I can receive with her. There are excellencies which, though not visible, to our carnal eyes are nevertheless agreeable to the spiritual heart, and such as all wise and good men cannot choose but be enamored with. For my own part, they seem to me such necessary qualifications that my heart trembles at the thought of ever having a wife without them. That's a good word. So, young men, get busy. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at, uh, I'm looking at our time. How's our time? 6.50. We're at 6.50. Okay, we're going to look at, uh, just look at a little bit of Thessalonians. I did post uh, a sermon on uh, First Thessalonians by John MacArthur, which I th- Thought, thought was really helpful. He did about seven years ago. And uh, it's talking about the Thessalonians, an interesting letter that it's the only letter that Paul wrote that didn't give a bunch of exhortations and he wasn't w- really worried about the Thessalonian church. Uh, he encouraged them to you know, keep, on, keep on track, but he loved the Thessalonians. It was uh, one of his favorite churches and his heart went out to them. And I think it's um, really um, a wonderful, a wonderful sermon. And it also talks about the necessity of of training up people. And and um, you know, and and his prayer life or his his concern to pray for the people in his congregation, like to see them come to fullness. It's not enough to. You know, to say, you know, give somebody a track and say, you know, here, you know, oh, you prayed the sinner's prayer. Well, you know, go off, be warm, be filled. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that, that we're, to, we're to make disciples. That means that we have to take an intense, uh, we have to be intently concerned for the people that we actually lead to the Lord. And, and sometimes that's quite difficult. And it can take a long period of time. And so we may be checking in and out with people. Uh, we may be, they, God may put them on our heart. We may send them a letter. Um, God is always wooing his people. And um, you know, we all go through ups and downs in our life. You know, nothing is 
is always stable. And, and so uh, God also chastens those he loves, and he draws them back to himself. So I think it's really important to, this is a very important letter. And again, uh, I went to Grace to You, and I looked up uh, the introduction to Thessal- Thessalonians, and it was a very good introduction. And, and basically the author and date, the Apostle Paul identified himself twice as the author of this letter. Silas and Timothy, Paul's traveling companions on the second missionary journey when the church was founded, were also mentioned in Paul's greeting. Though Paul was the single inspired author, most of the first person plural pronouns, we, us, our, um, refer to all three of them. However, during Timothy's visit back to Thessalonica, they refer only to Paul and Silvanus or Silas. Paul commonly used such editorial plurals because the letters came with the full support of his companions. Um, so these were uh, the first of Paul's two letters written from Corinth to the church of Thessalonica, and it was around A.D. 51. So this is not too long after Christ's death, you know, within 20 years. And the date has been Uh, archaeologically verified by inscription in the temple of Apollos at Delphi near Corinth. Isn't that interesting? Which dates Galileo's service, uh, Galileo's service as proconsul in Achaia, because they, in in, um, Thessalonians, uh, they refer to uh, Galileo's. And since Paul's letters to the churches of Galatia were written, probably written from uh, AD 49 through 51, this was his second piece of uh, correspondence. And um, it was by the uh, uh, northern reaches of the Aegean Sea. The city became the capital of Macedonia. And it was uh, a free city which was ruled by its own citizens under the Roman Empire. And uh, it served as a hub of political and commercial activity in Macedonia. You remember the Macedonians were really a giving people. And remember they, they collected gifts. Paul collected gifts from them to take to the uh, to the Jews in Jerusalem who were having, uh, the, the Messianic Jews that had come to faith were having a hard time. So he took a gift to them. So anyway, um, he goes through some of the historic themes and some of the challenges, and um, then he gives a, an outline. Well, um, we're kind of coming up to that time. Uh, I just want to make some announcements. Uh, remember to check out God's Library exploringgodslibrary.org. Uh, it's all one word, all run, no, no parentheses, no capitals, for extra materials, which we post daily, so you get the daily readings there. And you may also request to be put on a weekly list by sending an email to exploringgodslibrary at gmail.com. And that's, uh, uh, we only, if, if you request something, we can send something out. Otherwise, I just recommend you, you uh, subscribe to exploring God's library, and so when the post goes up, the the um, uh, the reading will go up for the day. However, since we're on the West Coast, uh, the the reading is not going up. Maybe early enough for some of you on the East Coast, if you're doing your morning devotions. So so do just send us an email, and we can send you out uh, the entire list. And I think you'll you'll find it uh, very helpful. Um, I'm gonna just uh, look at. William Grinnell, in closing, it's kind of encouraging. Um, I've been reading and have found myself reading over the years uh, some Puritan paperbacks uh, put out by Banner of Truth Trust. And one in particular is, it, there, it's a three-volume set. It's called The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. And it's considering hope and diligence in the smallest service. And it says that, His promises are like the beams of the sun. They shine as freely through the window of a poor man's cottage as through the prince's palace. Think about that. His promises shine as freely through the window of a poor man's cottage as through the prince's palace. So we dig and we read and we, we contemplate and we meditate on the word of God. We hide the word of God in our heart that we might not sin against the Lord. And, um, and so I'd just like to encourage you that during this time uh, to remember your purpose and goal. 
you know, it says that he will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is stayed on thee. And in these days, he is our, in, on all days, not just, you know, in the coronavirus and not just, you know, or a 9-11 or, or a, you know, you know a, a, a family tragedy or anything or in health problems. I mean, he's always our rock and he's our deliverer. He's our provider. And to get it, to know him better, we have to read his word. You know, President John Quincy Adams told his son, my custom is to read four or five chapters every morning immediately after rising from my bed. It employs about an hour of my time and seems to me the most suitable manner of beginning the day. And I think it is without a doubt the most important appointment of our day. If I don't pick up my phone, I'm really ha happy. If I don't pick up my phone and, and, and spend time in prayer and going to the scripture. And I think that's a, it's a really great way to begin the day. Well, let's close in prayer. And we'll close from uh, the prayer found in Ephesians three fourteen through 21. Abba, for this reason we bow our knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think or even imagine, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And Lord, do we add to that. We pray for all those that are, that are suffering these days from anxieties, from a fear of death, or any of these things, that they be released from that fear of death by looking and meditating and thinking on your word, and on your character, that you have said that, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, which means forever. Lord, that you hold us in your righteous, omnipotent hand, that nothing ever takes you by surprise, and that you guide and, and, and protect us from all the trials and tribulations, Lord, and that you, as Job said, Though you take me through these deep waters, though, though the olive might not uh, give its fruit, um, that I'm still going to praise the Lord because we know that you and your ways are righteous and true and good altogether. That when we come through these trials, we will come forth as purified gold. We will be better because of the trials and tribulations in our life. Thank you, Lord. We pray for all those that are struggling with physical problems right now, financial problems, anxieties over finances. We pray that you would be their solace, Lord, be their provider. You said, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, let our requests be made known to God, may be made known to you, and you will answer them. And certainly you do, Lord. You said, your, your, your David said, I have not seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread. So, Lord, you know the way that we go. You know the the needs of even the sparrow. So you've considered our needs as even more important than that little sparrow, as beautiful as it is. Thank you, Lord, for your tender, loving care. And thank you for your word, especially, Lord, which is our treasure, our hope. And you value your, your word. You said in the scriptures, even above your name, which is like, what does that mean? You value your word. I know you're the word made flesh who dwelt among us, that we behold, behold you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness, your mercies, and your tender, loving care every day. Be with us this week. Help us to read your word and endeavor to be more like you and to leave, to, to win the battle, not just against the, 
the foes and the problems of this world, but also against our own fallen nature. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being on tonight, and uh, I pray that uh, you have a, have a good week. God bless. Nice to see you, Tony, and Krikor, and Linda, and others. Blessings on you all. Have a good week.